Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Sigita. First of all, let me thank you for the invitation and LATO and of course the Faculty of Social Sciences of the University of Latvia and the Moldovan Embassy to Latvia for the opportunity to present to you today the topical issues of the Moldovan foreign policy. Of course, the discussion is even more important uh, as we mentioned uh, now due to the fact that the Eastern European countries after 30 years of independence are facing facing serious challenges and even attacks, I would say, uh, to their territorial integrity and sovereignty. Uh, Ukraine being uh, by now the last uh, vivid uh, example of it. Um, I will introduce myself, uh, as uh, Sigita already mentioned, my, my name is Victoria Rosa and I'm a security and defense uh, foreign policy uh, expert from the Republic of Moldova and my last posting was as the security and defense advisor of the Prime Minister of the Republic of Moldova uh, at that time Maya Sandu. Currently Maya Sandu is the President of the Republic of Moldova. Uh, my presentation will focus on the main foreign policy trend at the moment as well as I will touch upon uh, the most relevant domestic issues that shape the impact of uh, Moldova's uh, positioning as a country on on the European, but also on the international arena as well. I just wanted to ask if it is possible to, to share the presentation that I sent a few minutes ago. If not, then I will just continue the lecture as it is. Uh, I will try to share then because uh, I will open the computer and we'll, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll do that immediately, yeah? Yeah, that's just fine. A second. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe you could start then yeah, and I, I, could, will, I, could, I could start. Yeah. So I just wanted to mention the fact that from the very beginning, uh, I would like to draw your attention to some historical facts that practically define, uh, but others uh, also show the challenges that the Moldovan statehood is facing, but also the fact that at the moment, unfortunately, we are confronted with the uh, violation of our territorial integrity, but also our sovereignty. Um, of course, uh, as um, you all know, Republic of Moldova gained independence uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And actually it started um, even um, a little bit earlier with some events which uh, practically represented the emancipation uh, of uh, of the Moldovan uh, of the Moldovan Romanian people. Uh, on August 20, uh, 31st, 1989, the Romanian language and Latin alphabet was given the status of official language, which was actually embraced by the Moldovan population, but very highly criticized by a big part of the Russian-speaking minorities, uh, which were still connected and are still connected um, uh, at that point in time to the Soviet center, at this point in time to Moscow, and pleading uh, for the maintenance uh, at the time of the Soviet Union and of the Russian language, and today, of course, pleading of closer relationship with the Russian Federation. On April uh, 27, 1990s, the national flag, the tricolor, uh, as we call it, uh, which has uh, the three colors, blue, yellow, and red, with the Moldovan coat of arms and the national anthem, which is called Limba Noastra, were adopted. And on the 23rd of June, 1990s, uh, the Declaration of Sovereignty was passed, leading to the Declaration of Independence, uh, which was declared on August 27, 1991. Of course, uh, as you know, um, the Republic of Moldova uh, is also facing suggestionist, um, a suggestionist regime, a suggestionist situation on its territory. Um, and um, this started with the fact that on September 3rd, 1990s, in the 1990s, the Transnistrian Moldovan Republic, uh, in Russian called Prednestrovskaya Moldavskaya Respublika, PMR, was declared by the leaders of the secessionist movement initiated by high-ranking individuals of Russian origin in the Transnistrian region. The resistance and the secessionist tendencies in Transnistrian region uh, initiated, uh, as I mentioned, by a group of Russian speakers organized in paramilitary units called Workers' Detachment at that time, uh, were led by Igor Smirnov, 
who was later on uh, elected uh, or proclaimed, better said, uh, because we cannot talk about the free and fair election in such conditions, uh, as the so-called president of the region. Um, and also um, this kind of movement with paramilitary units took the form of violent clashes in different cities um, on the left bank of the Nistru River. Already in, nine, in the summer of 1992, uh, when um, these movements were backed up by Cossacks from uh, Russia and other volunteer fighters from other parts of the Soviet Union, and uh, its uh, uh, reminiscences of the 14th Army, which was stationed uh, in the Transnistrian region, the tension escalated into a large-scale outbreak. Moldovan law enforcement troops at that time lost positions in uh, the cities of Bender and Tikina, but also Dubasar. The fighting actually resulted, according to the estimations, in uh, more than 1,000 deaths on both sides, out of which 310 were civilians and, of course, more uh, wounded person. The number is uh, more than 3,000 uh, people. Also, uh, we had internally displaced people, about 130,000 people, uh, and over 70,000 um, refugees, uh, which uh, were seeking asylum in Russia, in Ukraine, in Belarus. And I think that one of the biggest challenges, but also problems that Moldova faced as a result of this uh, a small, uh, well, not necessarily small, but uh, in terms of a short term conflict uh, was the fact that um, the constitutional authorities have lost uh, the control over the Transnistrian region of the Republic of Moldova. Since then we, um, do not uh, we did not register human losses uh, and uh, violences in the Transnistrian region, but unfortunately the constitutional authorities do not have control over the region. The geopolitical uh, position of Moldova, um, uh, practically with neighboring uh, Ukraine and Romania. Uh, as well as the Soviet past, uh, in one way or another, determine uh, the geopolitical East-West narrative, which is uh, very much present in the Republic of Moldova, um, practically in all spheres of life. Here we're talking about the social sphere, the economic, the political, um, at, a more, uh, at a more larger uh, extent. We have to mention that um, uh, actually this uh, geopolitical East-West narrative also um, in one way or another have had an impact on the Moldovan foreign policy at different points uh, in time. Um, as uh, at the moment we don't have the presentation, but if we will have it later, uh, I will be able to, yeah, if we can go to the, uh, to, uh, slide uh, to slide number three. Uh, yes, uh, to slide number three, if it's possible. Uh, yeah, because here uh, you actually have uh, the question uh, in English. Um, uh, in uh, uh, June 2021, Moldovans uh, in a public opinion poll were asked uh, uh, if um, if where it were to vote uh, for the accession in the Eurasiatic uh, uh, Custom Union uh, or uh, in the European Union with whom they would vote. Um, just one second, uh, if you could uh, go back a little bit to the first slide, uh, the first one, please. Yeah, this one. Uh, and here you see the answers for the accession to the European Union uh, would have voted approximately 56% of voters. Um, but for the accession to the Eu Eurasian Union, we have 27% of votes. So practically, we have a quite high number of people who would choose uh, the European Union um, versus uh, the uh, Eura uh, Eurasiatic Customs union or um, practically uh, here we're talking about choosing between EU and the Russian Federation. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, 
it's uh, very interesting to see what would be the difference of um, the views of the people if they are asked to choose only one option um, because uh, being asked if they would uh, vote in a referendum for the accession to the European Union what would be their choice 65 percent which is quite a larger number than previous um, 65 percent of uh, people would vote for the accession to the European Union uh, and only 20 5.8% uh, would vote against. And if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, well, uh, here it's a very interesting um, data because uh, if uh, uh, people are asked only about the uh, Eurasiatic Customs Union, um, then we will see practically that 40.8% of the people will vote for, uh, which is quite um, uh, a big number compared to um, uh, compared to the figure that we had before when people were asked to choose between. It's actually a double number uh, but also we have a quite a large number of people who would vote against which is 47.5 this actually shows once again the fact that the Moldovan population is divided in um, two um, uh, banks. Uh, part of the population is very much uh, uh, in for closer relationship with the European Union, while another part of the population is still nostalgic for the Soviet, uh, Soviet Union, for the Soviet past, and they are still um, granting quite a lot of support uh, to the Russian Federation and to the integration model that the Russian Federation um, is actually promoting. Uh, we can go to the next uh, to the next slide. Um, what I would like to, to talk next, it would be actually about the relationship between the uh, Republic of Moldova and the European Union, because actually this is the main development vector that Republic of Moldova has chosen for a long time. Uh, and uh, it actually uh, gained a lot of popularity, as you also have um, uh, seen in the um, in the pictures uh, that were presented below. Um, I will mention the fact that the cornerstone in the Moldova-EU relations, paradoxically uh, or not, um, uh, actually represented the period uh, of colder relations with the Russian Federation. The rejection of the Cossack Memorandum, which was a plan for the settlement of the Transnistrian conflict that envisaged the federalization of the Republic of Moldova, has actually put on hold the support that was offered by the Russian Federation to the then Moldovan president, which was um, actually the leader of the Communist Party in the Republic of Moldova, Vladimir Voronin. Facing very serious and uh, um, economic, but also trade challenges because of the multiple embargoes that the Russian Federation has imposed on the Republic of Moldova. It was actually about um, related to the embargoes on wine and vegetables. Moldova actually had to turn to the European Union and made its first steps toward the European community. Um, at that time, it was merely official uh, because um, at uh, the, the Moldovan authorities were mostly uh, more um, representatives from the Communist Party. And at that point in time, we had uh, actually a president uh, which was the leader of the Communist Party in the Republic of Moldova. So um, actually in 2005, under the European Neighborhood Policy, the Republic of Moldova has made the first steps uh, in its cooperation with the European Union. And uh, the first uh, Moldova EU action plan was elaborated and adopted for a three years period. Subsequently, in 2008, the EU introduced autonomous trade preferences for Moldova. And uh, this was actually an instrument that allowed Moldova to slowly start integrating its economy into the EU internal market. As you know, the Moldovan products are now quite um, uh, present on the European uh, market. And here I'm talking uh, mostly about uh, wines. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, in 2003, uh, the Russian Federation has imposed um, embargoes on uh, 
uh, wine products from the Republic of Moldova on vegetables and fruits. And this is how Moldova started actually the process of reshaping its industry so that it is capable to export outside. This uh, also meant the fact that the Republic of Moldova started to be more competitive and started to change its economy uh, in a better way in order to be competitive on the, on the European market as well. Uh, a deeper and a faster political and economic EU approximation process uh, actually became possible uh, with the Eastern Partnership Initiative, which was launched uh, at the Prague Summit in 2009. Um, the Eastern Partnership Initiative was designed, as you know, for uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. And uh, it combined both bilateral, but also multilateral tracks of cooperation. The Eastern Partnership practically reflected the EU's institutional approach to the, Euro to the Eastern European countries by placing them, as we call it today, in the friend zone rather than providing them with a membership perspective that uh, some of the countries had uh, hoped for and actually still hope uh, for the membership perspective. Um, starting with 2010, the Moldovan pro-European uh, parliamentary coalition uh, committed to promote the European agenda. At that time, we do recall the colored revolution and also the changes that emerged uh, in the political uh, life of the Republic of Moldova, because we had a uh, pro-European uh, uh, parliament, but also government in place, which actually began uh, the institutional uh, reform processes, uh, which were connected to such topical issues as rule of law, independence of the justice sector, anti-corruption and human rights. Um, receiving major support, uh, financial, but also political support from the European partners, the Moldovan authorities initiated then two overarching processes, the implementation of the visa liberalization action plan that at the end uh, would uh, lead to visa-free regime for the Moldovan citizens, but also the negotiation of the association agreement. Following um, Moldova's successful implementation of all the benchmarks which were set in the visa liberalization action plan uh, on November 27, uh, 2013, the European Commission um, proposed to allow uh, visa-free travel to Schengen area for Moldovan citizens holding a biometric passport. Um, the abolishment of the visa obligation officially went into effect on uh, the 28th of April 2014. Uh, when the Republic of Moldova was uh, actually transferred from the list of third countries whose nationals are exempted uh, from uh, visa requirements for short-term stays in the Schengen area and Schengen-associated uh, countries. Overall, visa-free travel uh, has provided impetus for uh, reforms and interpersonal contacts between people, uh, but also offered uh, a safer environment for travel, development of business relationship, but also cultural exchanges, due to the fact that uh, citizens of the Republic of Moldova had an opportunity to travel in the uh, European countries and to stay there for a short period of time. This giving them the possibility to have uh, a freer uh, interaction, be it uh, in personal or business reasons in the European sp space. Uh, data provided by Moldovan authorities for, for the period from 28 April 2014 until um, 31 of December 2020 indicates that approximately 2.3 million Moldovan citizens have undertaken approximately 9 million trips to the Schengen area during the visa-free regime. I think that um, the visa-free regime actually represented a great step for the Moldovan society due to the fact that this gave us the possibility to get closer to the European 
development uh, model to the European development partner, uh, pattern, but also uh, in terms of culture, in terms of values, in terms of principles, in terms of everyday life. Uh, people in Moldova uh, had the possibility to familiarize themselves with the European civilizational choice, which later on became uh, one of the main, uh, I would say, a foreign policy vectors for the Republic of Moldova and that is joining the European Union. Two months later, um, after uh, Moldova being granting, granted the visa-free regime, um, on 27 of June 2014, the EU and Moldova signed an ambitious and innovative agreement that became actually the forefront document setting the political but also the economic uh, relations among the two um, between the Republic of Moldova and EU, namely, uh, that is the association agreement, which uh, included the deep and comprehensive free trade area, as we call it today, the DCFTA. The agreement was uh, provisionally applied from September 1, 2014, until uh, the completion of the ratification process, which actually allowed the full application of the association agreement from um, uh, 1st of July, 2016. The implementation of the association agreement is closely monitored by the European Union uh, by the means of the EU Moldova Association Council, through the association implementation reports. Um, actually, with the association agreement in place, Moldova practically started the modernization uh, process of the country, taking into account that the association agreement actually meant um, the fact that Republic of Moldova has committed to um, actually implement the uh, so-called uh, requirements of the acquis communautaire. And uh, practically Republic of Moldova in legal terms became more closer to uh, the European Union. Um, also the EU-Moldova relations changed dramatically in 2021 when for the first time in Moldova's history a pro-reform uh, party won parliamentary uh, majority, the party of action and solidarity, um, which received actually 52.8% of the votes, winning 63 out of 101 seats in the parliament. The new government formed solely by the Party of Action and Solidarity and led uh, by uh, Prime Minister um, Natalia Gavrilice received the parliament's endorsement on um, 6 August 2021 and started a full-scale reform process based on uh, revising institutional functionality and also based on meritocracy. Starting with the uh, president of the Republic of Moldova, Maya Sandu, um, the parliament and also the government declare uh, actually a war to corruption, but also to unlawfulness. And we know that the justice reform uh, is actually one of the main um, issues on uh, the agenda of uh, the presidency of the parliament, but also of the government. For um, the first time, I think that in 30 years, Moldova actually is fully committed to the European agenda as a driver for progress, welfare, but also sustainability, as it is also committed to its citizens' prosperity, well-being and safety. We must say that the relationship between the European Union and Moldova was not all the time smooth. And uh, starting with 2010, when actually the relationship between EU and Moldova became closer, there were different periods um, of uh, cooperation, of the level of cooperation, due to the fact that Moldova also faced a period um, of captured state, as uh, you might uh, heard about. And uh, also, unfortunately, Moldova had um, to pass through the period of uh, the 1 billion theft, which is still till now 
uh, in progress uh, and we're still trying to uh, analyze uh, and to, um, of course, um, uh, trial and to bring to justice those people who um, are responsible for the one billion theft during all this period of time, during the, the time when, um, unfortunately, um, the Moldovan institutions were captured, uh, the European Union uh, was close to, uh, it, to the citizens of the Republic of Moldova, and actually it was the first um, time, or at least this uh, events in uh, unfortunate events in the Republic of Moldova uh, um, have changed dramatically the way that the European Union communicated inside the country, because actually for the first time um, at that point in time, the European Union has changed its, its communication strategy. Um, and did not necessarily um, show too much support to um, political leaders uh, in the Republic of Moldova, as it was the case in 2010, but more uh, regarded and showed support to the citizens of the Republic of Moldova, mentioning that all the support that it is granted by the European Union it is for the people uh, of the for the people of the Republic of Moldova. Um, this was actually an important message launched by the European Union, uh, which um, was heard by the population, and uh, for this reason, uh, more um, popularity was granted to to the European Union, but also more credibility was granted to to the European Union by the Moldovan citizens. Of course, uh, large communication campaign were, were also in place uh, in order to show to the Moldovan public uh, all the activities, but also all the support that the Republic that the European Union is granting to the Republic of Moldova, uh, regardless of uh, of the regions, because a lot of support was also granted and it is still granted to the Gagauzian region, which uh, is a more pro-Russian region, uh, pro-Russian oriented. Um, and, uh, of course, um, a region which is granting um, and has uh, given more credibility uh, to, uh, to, the Russian, to the Russian Federation as a partner of the Republic of Moldova. Um, we have to mention that uh, over the last seven years, um, the EU has provided Moldova with grants uh, in the amount of more than half of a uh, billion euros. Um, and this for bilateral, uh, for bilateral assistance and enable access to 200 million loans and grants under macro-financial assistance programs, making the EU the biggest development aid partner to Moldova. In response to the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic worldwide, as part of the Team Europe approach, the EU also uh, committed a total of uh, 127 million euros in bilateral grant support to Moldova in order to deliver protective equipment, strengthen the healthcare system, and support the recovery process. Moldova was the first European country actually to benefit from the COVAX facility and the EU vaccine sharing mechanism, receiving more than 1 million doses of vaccines from the Team Europe and from COVAX. Also, what it is important to mention when we are talking about the geopolitical stance, but also um, the East-West narrative, is the fact that in the Republic of Moldova, um, the policy of the European Union and the narrative of the European Union was that the EU is about institution and it is not about geopolitics. Um, even though this was a narrative very widely promoted uh, by the European Union institution, it did not really sound convincing to the Russian Federation, which regarded uh, the European Union and still regards European Union, as we see also in the case of Ukraine, as an intruder in its interests, though, and a threat to its plan to reconstruct the collapsed uh, empire. Actually, 
Um, as I mentioned before, um, this created a new geopolitical East-West confrontation, which led to the societal divisions in the Republic of Moldova, but also transformed somehow the domestic, socioeconomic and political life into a one-way street, uh, either the EU or Russia. Um, and this actually is one of the main issues that uh, both Republic of Moldova faces, but also the region is facing. Because when we are talking about the Moldovan foreign policy, it has a very clear stand. Um, it is the uh, sovereign choice of the Republic of Moldova, which decided to follow the European path of development. But at the same time, Republic of Moldova's uh, foreign policy is not necessarily uh, or would not necessarily like to be a one-way street uh, because the Republic of Moldova was all the time open to cooperation and partnership with all countries, uh, regardless of uh, the difficulty uh, of the communication or the cooperation. So this is why we were always open to discussions with the Russian Federation, but based uh, uh, on the principle of mutual respect, of mutual respect of the independence, sovereignty, but also territorial integrity of the Republic of Moldova. Um, this is why, unfortunately, even though the European Union wanted to keep um, the discourse, but also the narrative in the institutional framework, it was practically impossible. And we see it uh, even more vivid now. It is impossible to talk only about institutions uh, when we have another actor, when we have an elephant in the room, which is not an elephant anymore, um, talking about geopolitics. Um, also, uh, one of the most um, important issues on the agenda of the Republic of Moldova and uh, EU, if we're talking in political terms, is also the membership perspective, as I mentioned previously. Um, because offering the countries a membership perspective would have meant um, a bigger um, support also from the part of the population to the reform agenda, taking into account that they would have already known to what they are aspiring to. Uh, otherwise, it is really hard to get the population support on difficult uh, and critical reforms as Moldova is, uh, for example, undergoing at the moment. Uh, we see that the justice reform in the Republic of Moldova, the anti-corruption, uh, practices that uh, um, are introduced at the moment are creating a lot of um, um, difficult situations uh, in this institutional but also societal uh, and uh, of course we all understand how difficult it is to um, practically reconstruct institutions from the very beginning and to introduce a new practice, new practice of, uh, of working in a new um, anti-corruptional, in a new uh, legal framework, um, which unfortunately was not uh, respected uh, and was not followed previously. Um, of course, uh, when we are talking about the EU Moldova, but also EU and Eastern Partnership, uh, countries' relation, we cannot avoid the topic of the enlargement fatigue. It is clear that membership perspective was not granted also due to the fact that there is not a um, common understanding of all the EU member states on um, the fact if they would like to grant membership perspective to the Eastern uh, partnership countries. Uh, and also due to the fact that there was an enlargement fatigue, there was also an, an ambiguous uh, relations uh, with the Russian Federation among different states from the European Union. But at the same time, we see that at the moment, um, the European Union is united in their answer to uh, the situation in Ukraine. And I think that uh, we as a country, uh, Moldova, but also other countries in the Eastern European, uh, uh, Eastern European region understand um, that the unity of the European Union also 
represent a guarantee uh, for our safetyness, for our independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. Um, if we can go to the next slide, um, we can skip this and go to, to the next one. Uh, before talking about the Moldova-Latvian relationships, I would uh, like to mention a little bit more about the Transnistrian region, uh, taking into account the situation that is happening now in the region. Uh, as I mentioned from the very beginning, the Transnistrian region is a separatist region in the Republic of uh, Moldova, uh, which is bordering uh, Ukraine. Uh, actually, when the conflict started, there were some uh, reasons for the conflict, which we consider at the moment to be artificial uh, reasons for um, for a violent for the violent clashes. Um, according to the last national uh, population census, which took place in Moldova and was organized in uh, 2014 by the National Bureau of Statistics on the entire territory of the Republic of Moldova, excluding the Transnistrian region. Uh, we have the data on ethnicity, but also on spoken language. When the conflict uh, out, um, outbroke in, uh, in the Transnistrian uh, region on the left bank of the Nistru River, as, uh, as we say, uh, one of the uh, reasons, uh, one of the roots of the conflict, which were mentioned by the separatist movements, was the fact that um, the language was changed. Uh, and here I'm talking about the Romanian language, which became um, the official language of the Republic of Moldova. It was also invoked um, the fear uh, of the Russian speakers that Republic of Moldova will unite with, uh, will re re reunite with, uh, with Romania, but also that uh, the rights of the Russian speaking population will be hindered. Uh, according to the data on ethnicity, but also on spoken language, which was an optional uh, question uh, during the census, um, we actually have a response in which 75.1% uh, of the population declared themselves Moldovans, 7% declared themselves Romanians, 6.6 .6 Ukrainians, 4.6 Gagawus, uh, 4.1 Russians, 1.9 Bulgarians, 0.3% Roma, and 0.5% other ethnicities, which uh, can include Belarusians, Jewish, Polish, Armenians. Uh, we have to mention the fact that actually uh, one of the issues that Moldova is facing at the moment um, is the fact that, uh, unfortunately, uh, the ethnic minorities in the Republic of Moldova are uh, most of them not speaking their own language. Um, but they are speaking Russian. Uh, this is why we are talking about a larger population uh, uh, which uh, speaks uh, the Russian uh, the Russian language. Um, the Moldovan ethnicity uh, represents the majority of the population throughout the regions of the Republic of Moldova. Um, Taraklia and the autonomous territorial unit of Kakavuzia uh, is an exception. Uh, because uh, in Taraklia we have um, more Bulgarian uh, living, and in the autonomous territorial unit of Gagauzia we have the Gagauz uh, people, which is concentrated uh, on that uh, territorial territory, which was granted um, uh, autonomy also at the beginning of uh, of nineties. Um, we have to mention that um, we also have um, Moldovan uh, citizens um, which speak the Russian, uh, the Russian uh, language. And um, unfortunately, till now, we see that um, um, a lot of um, people in the Republic of Moldova inform themselves from the Russian media. Um, this is why on our territory we have uh, a lot of uh, disinformation um, narratives um, out there uh, 
uh, both tackling political, social issues, and even more now uh, the situation beca became more critical during the pandemics. Um, also, uh, because of um, um, the fact that um, the uh, ethnicities, uh, different ethnicities in the Republic of Moldova speak more Russian, um, their own uh, language and traditions are disregarded. And this is why Republic of Moldova pleads um, for the uh, preservation uh, of the uh, language, but also of the traditions of the ethnicities which are represented uh, in, uh, in the Republic of, uh, of Moldova. When it comes to the naming uh, of the language, we have to mention that um, you might have heard uh, the dispute between uh, the name of the language. Uh, some call it Moldovan, some call it Romanian, and um, this is a widespread um, uh, disinformation narrative um, that these two languages are different, which is completely not uh, true. Um, uh, and it, it is still disputed in the Moldovan society, this issue. Um, because the naming of, of the language uh, actually uh, was um, the issue of a decision um, granted by the Republic of Moldova's Constitutional Court, uh, which uh, mentioned that uh, any constitutional review of uh, interpretation shall take into consideration not only the text of the constitution, because in the constitution it is mentioned the Moldovan language, but also the constitutional principles which are laid out in the Declaration of the Independence of the Republic of Moldova, where uh, it is specified that the language that the Republic of Moldova uh, has an as an official language is the Romanian language. It is quite um, an issue uh, because there are practically no differences. The Moldovan, uh, as they call it, the Moldovan language uh, might uh, is could be considered as a dialect of the Romanian language. But uh, in the Transnistrian region, uh, you uh, would have will have three official languages: the Moldovan, the Roma uh, the, the Moldovan, the Ukrainian, and the Russian language. Why they call it Moldovan? Because in the Transnistrian region, you will still have the Cyrillic alphabet for um, the Romanian language. Actually, this was an instrument, uh, a very strong instrument of Russification during the Soviet time. Uh, because uh, if you remember, when I started my presentation, I mentioned that one of the first facts that led to the emancipation uh, of the Moldovan Romanian people uh, was the fact that in 1989, the Romanian language in Latin alphabet, so it passed from Cyrillic to Latin, was granted the status of official language. Um, so practically the dispute, um, is it Moldovan or Romanian language was clarified by um, the constitutional court in the republic uh, in of the republic of moldova but still it is uh, a disputed uh, issue among the citizens themselves um, unfortunately the roots of the transnistrian uh, conflict uh, as i mentioned are quite artificial and um, uh, practically regard issues uh, which are not so uh, important um, uh, in terms of life functionality. Um, if we are talking about the settlement of the Transnistrian issue, uh, which is also a very important process, then I have to mention that at the moment we have um, the five plus two format put in place, uh, where we have uh, uh, the five plus two um, uh, means that we have two parties which are involved in the conflict, that it is Moldova and uh, Transnistria, as it is the terminology uh, of uh, the process of uh, settlement. Um, as uh, conflicting parties, on the other hand, we have Ukraine, OSE, and Russia as mediators, and uh, two uh, 
the plus two are the US and the EU, which have the status of observer. In our case, unfortunately, the Russian Federation has a double status. On one hand, um, they are um, mediators and they do have a peacekeeping contingent um, in place. And on the other hand, uh, we have the Russian Federation, which um, is actually uh, violating the territorial integrity, but also the sovereignty of the Republic of Moldova by having uh, um, its troops on the territory of the Republic of Moldova. Um, we are talking about those 1,500 uh, militaries which are stationed there illegally. Uh, but also we have uh, the remaining 20,000 tons of ammunition uh, on the territory of the of the Republic of Moldova, which are considered to be a big problem in terms of security, and now even more so taking into account the developments in Ukraine. I would also like to um, to talk a little bit uh, about the Moldova. Latvia relationship, taking into account that this year we had 30 years, we're celebrating 30 years of diplomatic um, relationship between the two countries. And um, just uh, to state some facts, on the 26th of August, uh, uh, Republic of Moldova recognized the regaining of independence of the Republic of, uh, of Latvia. Uh, it was in 1991. On the 1st of September 1992, diplomatic relations were established between Moldova and Latvia. Uh, if we are talking about the cooperation at the moment, then we can uh, mention the fact that we have 85 projects with an envelope of 1.4 million euros. Uh, which are granted for projects uh, which are related to such topics as regional development, justice reform, financial system, but also border control. At the same time, we also have a cooperation between uh, uh, we have a cooperation between the local authorities uh, in the Republic of Moldova and Latvia. We have 27 bilateral agreements uh, between them which are signed. Um, in Moldova, um, function about 62 companies with Latvian capital, with if, with the investments amounting um, at um, 33.5 million uh, Moldovan lanes. Uh, and this investments cover such areas as agriculture, transport, and tourism. Um, as you also see in the slide, uh, we also have um, uh, economic and trade relationship. The volume of foreign trade of Moldova Latvia amounts to 20 million into, amounted to 20 million in 2020. Uh, which is an increase actually. Uh, and the exports amount to 7.5 million. Imports amount to 12.6 million. According to the Latvian Bureau for Migration and Citizenship, 304 citizens of the Republic of Moldova have residence permit in, um, in Latvia. And in the Republic of Moldova live about, uh, uh, live about uh, 50 Latvians. Um, also, what I wanted to mention, and it's really important and crucial to us, is the fact that on August uh, 9, 2021, uh, 30,000 doses of um, anti-COVID vaccines were sent to Chisinau. Um, the assistance which was granted during um, this very difficult pandemic times to Moldova by the European countries and Latvia included, uh, was a great support for the Republic of Moldova. And of course, we are very grateful to, to the Latvian people, to the Latvian authorities for the support, as well as we are very grateful to the support uh, that Latvia, but also the Baltic countries is uh, granting to the Republic of Moldova uh, politically, taking into account the very difficult uh, situation in the, in the Eastern European region. Um, and of course, uh, as uh, we in Moldova say, um, there is no one 
better to understand Republic of Moldova than people in the Baltic states uh, and people who also uh, suffered um, the uh, from the Soviet uh, Soviet Empire um, and people who do understand uh, how uh, the Russian Federation acts uh, and what does it mean to to cooperate but also to discuss and to talk to the Russian Federation I think I will stop here I'm sorry if I was uh, a bit too long um, and I would be very happy to take uh, questions, but also to add some information in case something was missed. First of all, thank you very much uh, for a uh, really interesting insight. Uh, and I would like to remind, before the questions, I really would like to remind that we have a chance to have this lecture uh, because of great support of the embassy of uh, Moldova in Latvia. Uh, and it's uh, the lecture is organized with, with uh, Latvian uh, transatlantic organization and um, uh, Faculty of Social Science of University of Latvia. Uh, I think we can turn off record of the lecture and uh, go on with questions uh, without the record. Uh, 